We are talking about finding purpose, finding purpose. And we are on our third lesson, part one, lesson three, essentially. And uh, we've talked already about purpose. The first lesson, I I told you what purpose was. It's really important to define what it is you're talking about. If you're not defining what it is you're talking about, no one knows. So we talked about purpose, and then we talked about the purpose of purpose. And quite frankly, there is a purpose for purpose. I mentioned to you that the purpose is, uh, is the end result. I mentioned to you also that purpose can be the reason why you do what you do, but in this case, we're talking about what it is that you do that's at the end. What are you here for? I think a lot of us have pondered this question in our lives. Why are we here anyway? Why are we doing what we're doing? I had a friend of mine that was in the, uh, and I had lots of friends in the military. Uh, this particular friend, uh, friend, his name was Chad Plant. And uh, we went to school in northern Minnesota. I was, uh, was going for uh, criminal justice and he was going for engineering. And, uh, but he was in the military before he went there to, uh, to college. And, uh, and I, he, had, he had mentioned to me just kind of at a whim, he says, uh, he says, yeah, the military does weird things. I said, yeah? And he says, oh, yeah, all sorts of weird things. It's just time to just wonder. I said, well, give me an instance. And he says, well, for instance, he says, I remember I was standing out in a line out in front of the barracks, ready to go in. And uh, the, the drill instructor would, uh, he looked at us, and there was about a uh, hundred of us standing in this line. It was a big barracks, but it was like a hundred of us standing in this line. And the door was shut, and he looked at us, and he says, you got 30 seconds to get in this, to get in this barracks. And nobody moved. And he says, you now have 25 seconds. And so they opened the door, and, uh, and they tried to funnel all the people in. And, uh, of course, they didn't make it. So he says, get out of here. So he, everybody goes back outside, and they stand in front of, the, in front of this door. And, and uh, so there they were standing. And he looked at this group of people, group of men and women, whoever it was, and he says, you got 30 seconds to get in this barracks. And so now they're thinking. And so they try, and they're all, getting in, they're all trying to get in, and they couldn't get in. Now, he had known for sure that you couldn't get 100 men inside this door in 30 seconds. So they failed, and he says, get out of here. So they all moved back outside, and they did this over and over again. And I said, so what's your point, Chad? And he says, I have no idea what he was trying to do. But he, I said, did you ever make it? And he says, yeah, we did, actually. One guy stepped forward and opened the door for the 99 other guys that ran in, and he got in just in time. And I said, well, that was the purpose. That's what he was trying to do. He was trying to get you to think like that. And he says, no, it wasn't. He says, we do other dumb things. (laughs) I talked to this one guy, and uh, he was a um, military, Marine, he's a Marine, and he he said, said, well, we don't like to, uh, in the Marines, we don't like to have things on our record. I said, so? How do you mitigate, you know, disciplinary uh, matters then? He says, we do dumb things. And I said, what's the dumbest thing you ever done? This one guy chimed in. He says, I guarded a latrine once. You guarded a latrine? A bathroom? He says, yeah. I said, well, what's the dumbest thing you've done? And he says, well, I went down to Guantanamo Bay, and uh, <clears throat> there, was, uh, there was an ammo, uh, 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 a pallet full of uh, uh, ammunition uh, crates that were sitting on top of this pallet in this uh, fenced-off area. And I said, uh, so you guarded it. I said, what was, uh, why did you guard it? He says, well, I don't know. I said, what was, what was it? He says, he says it, was, it was ammo boxes. And I said, well, you're guarding the ammo. That's the purpose. And he says, there was no ammo in it. <laughs> and I said, you telling me you stood out there with your machine gun and watched over an empty, and he said, a pallet of ammo crate. Yeah. I said, well, there's no purpose there, is there? And he says, well, the purpose was It was disciplinary action, and he wants to make sure that it doesn't end up on your record. So I don't know if you felt like that, like you do some things that just don't make any sense, and and our life is full of that at times. Like sometimes we wonder, what are we here for? What are we doing? And I know for me personally, I don't like to do things without a reason. I want a reason for doing this. 
I don't want to continually beat my head against the wall and say, what am I doing this for anyway? It's got to be a purpose. So we're trying to find purpose. So we talked about the purpose of purpose. We also talked uh, two weeks ago about the purpose of passion. The purpose of passion. Now this is, this is a real exciting one for me because uh, this gets you to where you need to go. And it gets you there quickly. When you're excited about your purpose in life, some of us find our purpose and find no value in that purpose. We've all done that too. Like I know what I'm doing but I don't want to be doing it. And that's another tough one. So we talked about the purpose of passion and how we ought to be passionate. I mentioned that uh, passion should be powerful and passion should be properly placed. Uh, it's crucial, I mentioned two weeks ago, that it's, uh, it's crucial for persuasion. If you want to persuade somebody, you have to have passion. You can't persuade somebody. I mean, can you imagine... Uh, someone coming to your door trying to sell you a vacuum and saying, hey, I got a vacuum. And uh, <laughs> it's a good one. I think you ought to buy it. You know, if the guy comes to your door and he's like, dude, check it out. Let me just come in and just, you know, you'd be like, wow, this guy's really excited about this thing. And he is going to be more persuasive than someone who doesn't care. The apathy problem, right? The apathy problem. Like, I don't care. You might have a, you might have a purpose, but now you don't care about it. So you have to have passion about your purpose. So this morning, we're going to talk about the purpose of perspective. The purpose of perspective. And we've already talked a little bit about perspective because Howard had mentioned the rain. Actually, I think it was Maxine who mentioned the rain. We need rain. And now some of us, some of us say to ourselves, we need rain. Some of us might say we don't need rain. I don't know how many of you like static. I would prefer marginal humidity. And I won't have to rub my legs down with lotion. Okay? I mean, I want some, some humidity. But you get too much humidity, and that's brutal too, right? So now you've got this perspective of, like, sometimes you want the humidity, sometimes you don't, sometimes you want the rain, sometimes you want the sun, unless you have to be in the sun forever. One of my, one of my uh, old uh, employers, he said he worked in Nevada. I said, Nevada? Yeah, we were talking about how nice it was outside. I said, oh, it's beautiful, sun's out. And he says, I worked in Nevada. And I said, you worked in Nevada? I said, so what does it have to do with how nice it is? Be like, I love clouds. He says, you have 360 days of no clouds. You know, I love clouds. And so that's perspective. He wanted to see clouds where I was like, I just want, don't want to see any clouds right now. Perspective is important. So. One person said, the world changes when we change our perspective. The world changes when we change our perspective. Devine, the famous English art connoisseur, took his little daughter to the beach one day, but could not get her to go into the chilly water. After persuasion failed, he borrowed a tea kettle, built a fire, and heated a little water until it steamed beautifully. With much flourish, he poured it into the ocean. Greatly impressed, his daughter went in without a murmur. Now suffice it to say that I believe his daughter was thinking that, his, that her dad just warmed the entire ocean with that water pot. It was perspective. It was perspective. Now, recently, I, uh, I was listening to a... Um, a group of political activists. This is no joke. I was listening to a, a group of political activists and they were, they were talking about the summer parades. And uh, they, they thought how good of an idea it would, would be to have another float in a parade where some of the elderly people could maybe just ride on the float and, uh, and then participate in the parade. And as I was listening to this, uh, pretty much the majority of them were saying, oh, this is a great idea, this is a great way to get the elderly folks involved in a parade. And, and, and I started to think about this. And so I knew, I knew one of the people who was in this group, so I had to shoot a, a quick text message. And the text message is something like this, I'm sure that will look great to a community of young parade attendees. 
this is their perspective that their political group has to tote around a bunch of the old people on a parade. That is the perspective that I saw. Now, they saw the perspective as, no, this is a great way to get people involved. And I said, what they're doing is they're sending a big signal to the community saying, we got all the old folks in our political group. And now to me, I, I think that's just one way to view it. Your perspective is crucial. And as I said, the world changes when we change our perspective. One dictionary defines perspective this way. It's a particular attitude towards or way of regarding something. It's a point of view. It's a point of view. Because two people can look at the very same thing and see something totally different. And you all know that you can do that as well. Some of us look at a halfway full glass as empty. And some of us look at it as halfway full. You ask an optimist, is this glass half full or half empty? And they'll say, that baby is half full. And because of the way they view it, now ask them to share it. Their chances, even if they're not generous, they'll share it. Because to them, the glass is half full. Now you ask a pessimist that same question about a glass that's half full, and they'll say, that baby's half empty. And you say, will you share it then? And even if they are a generous person, chances are they'll say no, because they only have a little left. Perspective is very, very important. When we talk about our purpose in life and how we connect the two together, how you view things is important. We all want to know what our purpose is in life. We all want to know what our purpose is. But if we view things one way over here, we'll see it different than the other way over here. So we have to have the proper perspective. Okay, let's look at a couple things. First of all, there's two ways primarily to view perspective. There's two essentially opposite perspectives. One is the world's perspective. The world's perspective. The other is the word's perspective. Two different words, W-O-R-L-D, the world, and then you have the word, W-O-R-D. These are two opposite ways of viewing everything. Your perspective is important when dealing with your purpose, and I'm going to get to exactly why. First of all, let's look at a couple differences between the world's way of viewing things and the word's <laughs> way of viewing things. First of all, John chapter 3. John chapter 3. And the world, W-O-R-L-D, the world loves darkness. Here's what the world says. John 3, 19 through 20. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. They love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Here we go. Verse 20, for everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. The world's way of viewing things is they love darkness. They love doing evil, and if they're doing evil, they hate the light. Neither cometh to the light, lest their deeds should be reproved. One of the reasons why the world hates, listen to this, or rather loves darkness, why the world loves darkness, is because their deeds are evil. What they do is wrong. If you view things through the world's way of viewing things, you're going to eventually love darkness. You're going to love evil. You're not going to love the things of God. You're going to love the things that are absent from God. If your perspective is a worldly perspective, you're going to love darkness, you're going to love evil, and you're not going to love the light. You're not going to go to the light. And here's why. Because... Neither cometh to the light, lest, that's because, because his deeds are evil and they are to be reproved. So deeds are evil, they're going to be reproved. They look at things differently than we look at things through the word. One commentator said this, just as natural light shows up what is otherwise unseen, so Christ the light exposes people's deeds as evil. That is exactly what happens. The deeds that 
the world does are evil, and they know it, and we know it. And what Christ the light does, it exposes those evil deeds. And therefore, verse 20, their deeds are reproved. So they hate going towards the light. They do not like that. The world loves the darkness because it's a safe place. And when you are in a dark place, you can hide from things because you don't have to see it. And you know what? Other people can't see it either. This is a worldly perspective. A worldly perspective. The world, the world does not love Christians. Okay? This is just a pretty standard. The world does not love Christians. Matter of fact, I don't think they've ever really loved Christians. There has been small groups of people who love and embrace Christianity. But for all intents and purposes, the world does not like Christians or nothing that even ties them back to a Judeo-Christian type of faith. First century, they don't like that. Matter of fact, back in, in the time when Hitler was, was running the show over in Germany, he was literally trying to scrub out, literally trying to erase all of the Jews. That was his plan, to get rid of them all. Now we have a similar problem. We don't have anti-Semitism as bad, but we have what's called anti-Zionism, which comes from uh, replacement theology, which we won't get into all that. But basically, here's what they're trying to do. They're not trying to scrub out all the Jews. They're trying to scrub out all the history of the Jews. So if they can't get rid of the people, get rid of their history. And by virtue of getting rid of their history, we get rid of the people. That's the anti-Zionist view. The world doesn't like Christians. If anything, we get rid of this type of, this type of thinking. I would say that the agnostics and the atheists and the, the I'm going to come up with a new word, the, the ignoramuses, that's a word, right? They, they don't want anything to do with Christianity because Christianity poses a threat because it's a light revealer. It's a deed reprover. That, that is one reason why people don't want to come to Christianity, because they're afraid of what Christianity imposes on them, and that is reproof. The world looks at Christianity in a negative slant. That is how, that is how the world sees it. The world sees it, and it will continually see it that way. It will continually see it that way. The world does not love Christians, let's jump back to John 7, 7. The world cannot hate you, it hateth me, because I testify of it that, that the works thereof are evil. Okay, so he's saying that God, Jesus, is testifying uh, of, he's testifying that what the world does is evil. So can you imagine why nobody wants anything to do? Why is the name Jesus so offensive? The name Jesus is so offensive is because Jesus is a reprover to the world. To us, he's a redeemer. But that is perspective. To the world's viewpoint, to the world, in the world's perspective, they look at Jesus Christ as reprover, we look at him as redeemer. He came to save us from our sin. To the world, he came to condemn them of their sin. Two different perspectives. Perspective matters. And it matters when we talk about purpose. It matters when we talk about purpose. Now, let's look at John 15. It says this, If the world hate you, ye know that it hateth me before it hateth you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. Now, this is really telling. Ready? Here. But because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. So here's what he's saying. He's saying the reason the world hates you is because you're not like them. Because you view things differently than the world views things, they're going to hate you. Now, if you were of the world, the world would love you. And you all have experienced this. Anybody who has practiced separation from their past and has said, you know what, I'm not going to walk where, 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 the, where the wicked people walk, and I'm not going to do the things the wicked people do. Anybody who has separated yourself from them, know that you have been mocked and scoffed at. You know that. They don't see things the way we see things. We look at this, we look at this and say, if we were like them, they would love us. But we're not like them, we're like Christ. We try to be like Christ. So therefore, there is a rejection. It's perspective. And perspective is important when you're dealing with purpose. 
The, the, no matter what we do, the world will reject us. We are, in, in a sense, monotheistic in our, in our, in our thinking. That means we, we believe in one God. Now, that one God is Jesus, and he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by him. And we know that, and we embrace that. But to the world, they don't see it that way. They exercise something called idolatrous worship, essentially, and they're worshiping many gods. And this is a different perspective. And here is why in Exodus chapter 20, verse 3, the first commandment starts out with this, thou shalt have no other gods before me. The reason for that is that God knew that the world sees things differently than the word sees things. Two different perspectives. One perspective is let's worship everything or anything. And that's the world's perspective. The word's perspective is monotheistic in basis. And they're saying, God, the the Bible is saying, let's worship one God and his name is Jesus. And so it's different than the world. And this is important when we talk about perspective. If you're viewing things with the world's, the W-O-R-L-D-S, the world's viewpoint and perspective, it's going to be different than the word's perspective. This is very, very important. And if you have a word-like perspective, you're going to have a word-like result. If you're going to have a world-like perspective, you will have a world-like result. You end up in the place that reflects your perspective. And this is always true. You always end up in the place that reflects your perspective. I mentioned a while back in another series, you will become like the majority of your influence. You'll become like the majority of your influence. That's why they say that birds of the same feather flock together. Because the majority of ducks fly with ducks. And the majority of the world hangs with the world and does world-like things. And the majority of the word-like people hang with people who embrace the word and do word-like things. This is really important. Okay, let's look at a... Now, we looked at how the, the world does not love Christians. It does not love God. It does not love Christians. Uh, the word-like perspective says this. Here's what the word says. Here's what the word says. Love not the world. This is what the word says. The W-O-R-D says, don't love the world. The W-O-R-L-D, don't love the world. Neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, not of God, not of the word. Think about it that way. But of the world. So when, when we think about, about the difference between the world and the word, this is important. The word says don't love the world, and the world says don't love the word. So how you view things, your perspective is important when you talk about your purpose. It's very important when you talk about your purpose. Okay. Here's what, here's what the word says. The word says, and be not conformed to the world, right? That's what the word says. The world says, do not be conformed to the word. Two different sides of it. And and there is a polarity in here that repels to the ends of the universe. They do not like each other. They do not like each other. There are two different purposes. There are motives. There's agendas. There's just absolute vast space in between this. You cannot get any further from the side from each side. The word does not love the world in the sense of the things that are in the world, as we saw in uh, in First John chapter two. The world does not love the word or anything that pertains to the word. It wants to absolutely get rid of everything, any semblance, any residue of of anything that's of God. And they will do everything that's anti-God. 
So you have one that's anti-God and you have the other one that's, that's, that's everything for God. You have the world's perspective and the word's perspective. And here is where it boils down. Here's where it boils down. The world says this, love the word, the world. The world says love the world, hate God because he's a reprover. And the word says to love, to love the word, to love the word, to love God because he's a redeemer. Two different sides of things. Two different perspectives. If you view things from a world's perspective, you will end up with a world-like result. And if you view things through a word-like perspective, you'll end up with a word-like result. And this is important to finding your purpose. Because what it boils down to is the difference between everything that's earthly and everything that's eternal. The earthly only produces temporal things which result in no purpose. The eternal, the eternal side of things produces everything that is forever, anything that's infinite, and it has a purpose. And this is one reason why the world wanders around looking for things in areas they're not going to find it. They can't find it there, but there's no purpose because it's temporal. And it's all based upon the perspective of the world. The world produces world-like things. And the word produces word-like things, word results. An earthly perspective is temporal, and an eternal perspective is always looking forward to the future. Now, perspective influences how we act. Your perspective influences how you act. It it, it, it determines things. If you perceive something to be true, which unfortunately, perception is oftentimes reality. If you perceive something to be true, you're going to plan differently. Therefore, you're going to act differently. Let me give you an example. If you were going to go out to eat this afternoon, you would dress differently than if you're going to the gym or if you're going swimming. Because what you perceive to be true, you act different. So because I'm going to the beach, I'm going to wear something different than I would be going to the gym or going out to eat or coming to church. Your perception influences your purpose. And here's how. And here's how. I'm going to give it to you. The temporal or earthly practice it's based on a, on a worldly perspective. And that is this. If it's all about the world, if it's all temporal, if it's all evolutionary, if it's all accidental, then we have no purpose. Because we weren't created for any specific purpose. And where the, where the word perspective comes in is if it's based on God's word, if it's based on the word, we know, we know that we have an eternal or heavenly perspective. And that heavenly perspective says this, that we were created. And if we were created, we're created for a purpose. If you view things through the world, you'll never have an actual purpose. Everything that we do will always be temporal. It'll always be earthly. It'll always be fleshly. It will always result in fleshly things, earthly things, temporal things, worldly things, which are no purpose. But if we look at things through God's word, we see, thing, we see things totally different. When we see things through God's word, we know that he created us. We didn't just evolve here by accident. We were put here on purpose. We weren't just an evolutionary accident. We were created on purpose. And we can find our purpose. And so oftentimes, here's what happens. We look for our purpose in the world. We try to find our purpose that we learn from God's word and we look for it in the world. 
And that will result you in nothing. It will result you in nothing because they keep looking and looking and can't find anything. And you know, ironically, when people actually begin to find their purpose, you know where they look? They look in the word. Because they find that we were created. And if we are created, we're created for a purpose. On purpose. And so where do we look for? Where do we look for that purpose? Where do we look for our purpose? And this is important. I can't get excited about anything in the world. The the, the only thing I can get excited about is looking through God's word and seeing things that are from the word that are eternal, that are heavenly, that are on purpose, not accidental, but that are on purpose. We were created for a reason. And you can't find that in the world. You can only find that in the word. This is why the vast majority of people struggle. They're looking in all of the wrong places to find all of the right things. Most people, most people engage in worldly activities in order to satisfy their desire for purpose. And I say, wait a second, let's go to God's word and see what God's word has to say about us. They are opposite of us. The the, the world's way of thinking is different than the word's way of thinking. We have to understand that as we begin because we got eight weeks And I can't give you anything of our purpose from the world. It just doesn't exist. Because to them, we were here by accident. And we were created not for a reason or on purpose. It's just, we're just here. You know, one of the biggest places you see this is you see see that type of thinking. When I was in India, when I was in India, 2004 or 5, something. When I was in India, they believe in something called reincarnation which basically you die and you just come back as something else. So, who knows? So you know what that, what that does to their perspective? You know how much they value life? They don't. They don't value life. And the reason they don't value life is because their perspective is that, well, if they die, they're just going to come back at something else and there's really no purpose for them. So what that has done is it has totally changed their world to mean something that if they come back as, a, <clears throat> as an animal or another person in a higher caste, it's just it's what it is. But we have to go to God's word and we say, we were created for a specific purpose. And that is a word-like result. So don't look in the world for your answers. Never look, never look in the world for your answers because you're not going to find them. You're going to find world type results. So you spend time around people, you spend time around people who are influenced by the word, and you're going to become like the majority of people you hang around. You will also be influenced by the word. And therefore, you'll find your purpose. Finding our purpose is very, very important. If it's not about, if we're not here forever, if, if there is no eternal life, then, then I'm quitting. I quit my job. What are we here for if it's not eternal? If we will not one day live with our heavenly father, what are we doing? What are we doing? If it's not real, if it doesn't, if if, if we were just an accident, just by chance, we're here from the smallest little amoeba that came from the, the smallest little particle from a big bang, and it was no, and there was nothing. If there's nothing unique about us, and, and if there's more planets like this amongst the 50 trillion that are in the, in the universe, then, then, uh, th- then why are we here at church? But I promise you this people have been piercing through the depths of the universe for a very long time. And they can't find anything that even resembles us. There is nothing even close. They can't even find water. Water is the most abundant thing on the planet. They can't even find that. And if they did find that, they would say, hey, there's, we could have life on another planet. Forget the temperature, forget the ozone and the protective, you know, and the food and the vegetation and, and your iPhone. Forget all that. 
You're just, you just, you just can be out on another planet somewhere. 200 degrees, 1,000 degrees below zero. I mean, I don't know. When you look at the uniqueness of us in this little planet that's just placed perfectly, it has the right spin, it has the right protective ozone, the right distance from the sun, the right elements, the right everything, we're unique. And we were created for a purpose. And that purpose can only be found in what God says in his word. Beginning by, do you know for sure that you'll spend an eternity with God? Are we absolutely certain of that? Are you absolutely certain? Do you, do you believe it so much that you tell other people about it? Do you tell other people that you have a purpose? And this isn't self-help, though it helps the self. This isn't self-help talk. This is real. This is the real deal. You can know for sure God exists. And you can spend an eternity with him. And you can find your purpose in life. By looking in his word. And you know what the word says? The word says that we're all sinners. And that we are all in need of a savior. We look at Jesus as a redeemer. Not a reprover. Though he does reprove. And he does reprove the world. Of sin, righteousness, and judgment. We know that. But we look to him as something, as something different. He is our redeemer. He buys us. He purchases us. Our soul. He, that's how he, he buys our soul. And how does he do that? He buys it on the cross of Calvary. He dies for our sin. Here we are with, here we are, and here's, our, here's all of our sin. And those of you who go to the graduation, I guarantee you'll see this tonight. I might even do this tonight. I don't know. We'll see. Anyway, here we are with all of our sin. The Bible says that God loves us and hates our sin. It's, it's a universal truth universal truth. We find that in his word. That's not what the world says. But that's what his word says. Here we are with our sin. The Bible says that God loves us and hates our sin. That's in the word, not in the world. There's a lot of people who think they can turn over a new leaf or get baptized or walk an aisle or give money or raise a hand or pray a prayer. That does not save you. You know, that's the world's antidote. That's what the world says. The world says, just be a good person. Now, I think you ought to be a good person. But you can be a really good person, and you can't get, you're not going to go to heaven because of that. Being good is good, but being good isn't good enough to get you to heaven. You've got to be perfect. And that's found in the Word, not in the world. The world says, the world says why do bad things happen to good people? The word says, why do good things happen to bad people? Two different perspectives. It's about perspective. If you want to find your purpose, we have to find perspective. Here we are with our sin. The Bible says God loves us but hates our sin. The Bible says in order to go to heaven, the word says that in order to go to heaven, you have to be sinless. You have to be perfect. To the world, they say you can do that by work. The word says this, it's to the man that worketh not but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. It says his faith is counted for righteousness. The world says it's your good works that's counted for righteousness. The word says it's your faith that's counted for righteousness. Two different, two different things. The world says you can work for it and you can earn it and somehow go to heaven. But God says that's not true. That's not true. The Bible says Jesus Christ came to this earth 2,000 years ago to die on the cross to pay for your sin. And he was buried and he rose again the third day, proving that his payment, his death. Remember, the wages of sin is death. Someone has to die for your sin. 2,000 years ago, it was Jesus who died. But if he would have died and stayed dead, he would have not been God. He had to come back from the grave. That's the purpose of the resurrection. He had to come back from the grave. And when he came back from the grave, he proved to the Heavenly Father that his payment of death was sufficient to pay for the wages of sin because he said the wages of sin was death. So 2,000 years ago, he died on the cross, was buried and rose again. And what the Bible says is not by works of righteousness, which you are saved, but it says, for by grace are you saved through faith. Trusting, depending, relying upon Jesus Christ as your Savior. That's it. 
It's not about doing a good work. That's what the world says. The word says it's about God's work. Two different things. I pray that everybody here knows Christ as their Savior. I believe that we do. Now we have to just, we have to propagate this message throughout the world. We got to tell other people the exciting truth that Jesus died and that he is alive again.